inside America's boardrooms. The informational show for board members and corporate secretaries. Brought to you with knowledge partners, NASDAQ, the Center for Audit Quality, and PwC. Along with content contributors, Equilar, Meridian Compensation Partners, Wilson Sonsini Goodridge and Rosati, Donnelly Financial Solutions, and the Society for Corporate Governance. Welcome to this edition of Inside America's Boardrooms. I'm TK Kerstetter, the CEO of Boardroom Resources and your host for today's show. Uh, we have a great show today and a very interesting guest, and we're going to be talking about how boards can avoid a disruptive activist. And joining me is an activist um, that um, has had a very interesting career, which we'll talk about, but welcome Greg Taxon who's the managing member of Spotlight Advisors. Good Welcome, morning. Greg. Hi. It's a pleasure to have you back again. <laughs> Thank you. So first, let's track your career, because I think this is very interesting for anybody that's watching. Um, you started your career as an attorney at Wachtell Lipton, a very pro-business corporate law firm. Then you did uh, stints at Goldman Sachs and some other securities firms. I did. <laughs> so then you were the co-founder and CEO of Glass-Lewis, the proxy advisor. I was. Um, one of the largest in the world. Uh, then there was a phase where you went into the activist mode, uh, working right. with several asset managers, served on a board of directors, and that morphed into your managing role of Spotlight Advisors, which advises companies, investors on all kinds of stock and governance situations. So, very <laughs> interesting career. Sort of explain what took you that route? Because you've served on both sides of the table, which is which sure. is interesting. I think I think only you and my mother have my have my career down uh, to to that level of precision. But yes, it's uh, you know careers, of course, only take place linearly. You, you get the chance, you know, in retrospect, I suppose, to put some sense to them. Um, what I was always interested in was ensuring that capital in our capital markets is allocated efficiently. And so, you know, initially I was working with boards and companies as an advisor to them and found that to be a fascinating role, but I realized that investors don't have all the information they needed in order to make good decisions about risk and capital allocation. And that's really where Glass-Lewis came from. It was an opportunity to help investors uh, understand a, an important element of risk, which after all had, had created huge problems at WorldCom and Enron and HealthSouth and a number of other places. Um, and so I thought it was important to get that information into the hands of investors. Then I realized as well that you know, investors weren't pricing opportunity and risk very well and there was a chance to work as an investor uh, to get companies to move in a direction that would uh, be more beneficial for their owners. And, and so that was uh, you know, my stint of, as an activist. And, and now I'm pleased to be working really with, with people on both sides, with both corporations um, and investors in these complex situations where uh, there's engagement between shareholders and boards and companies and, and usually some controversy about the best path forward and the right way to allocate capital and risk. So we wanted to spend a good time today to talk about avoiding disruptive activism and we both know that there's different types of activism. Um, but there's a good reason why, and one of the reasons why is for a company not to be involved in a proxy battle. Um, I've had the, I wouldn't necessarily call it pleasure, but I've had the experience of being through two right. proxy battles with public companies. Very disruptive, um, certainly takes all of management and the board out of their normal process, but um, talk a little bit about the dis disruptiveness of that and why somebody's willing at some point in time, put their own money up to say, hey, here we go. Yeah, so, so I think you've, you've said it very well. I mean, I, I've been involved in 50-something situations, 55 or 60 situations that were either threatened proxy fights or, or actual proxy fights that went to the end. And I can tell you, in, in almost every one of those, um, the management team and board found themselves uh, you know, more engaged, more you know, involved in the quagmire, the negotiations, the discussion of kind of what to do in the best path, for, best path forward than they probably ever imagined. And in proxy fights that actually go to a vote, my experience is that, that the CEO and probably a director and the CFO will spend a couple of hours of every day focused solely you know, on the proxy fight for months. 
And that disruption to the, to the sort of the operation of their business really can't be understated, I mean, it, or overstated. You know, it's, 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 it's a massive change from the, the, the already full day that those people, uh, you know, have in their business lives, not to mention the expense. You know, so most companies will spend between four and six million dollars, you know, on this effort. So it's, it's a lot of disruption and a lot of expense. Yeah, and it's not just senior management. I know on the first one, I was a, a senior vice president managing a whole group of branches and whatever. And I had to take X amount of my day to call certain shareholders that I was assigned, okay, and explain the situation and try and recruit their vote. So it trickles down yeah. the organization. And of course, well. it's very disruptive even for line employees who, who want to follow the news and, you know, get distracted from their tasks uh, as they worry about their future and the future of the company and is that division going to get sold, you know, right. or, you know, or, or are we going to, you know, sell something off or close something down and... Uh, it's going to be very disruptive to the yeah. whole organization. So let's get to the meat of what we wanted to talk about, which was avoiding uh, this disruptive activism. Right. And sort of from where I sit, because of your experience, you're a very good person to ask this question to, and that's what steps should a company and or board take to avoid a bout of disruptive activism? Well, look, the easiest thing to do is to operate the business perfectly and get really lucky. You know, but, but of course, you can't count on that. Um, so there are some procedural things, you know, some, some sort of regular practices that I think make sense to, to implement, reduce the chances that you are going to become, uh, you know, the object of this sort of disruptive bout of activism, as, as, as you describe it. I think first and foremost, um, you know, a, a key here is to uh, be thinking constantly about board composition and refreshment. And, you know, it's, it's, it's fairly rare to find an activist with a long list of complaints uh, at a company where the board has been self-refreshing and sort of reflective about the skill sets, the risks and the opportunities, you know, in the business and finding people who can assist with those and bring fresh perspectives to it on a regular basis. So I think one of the keys is to make sure that the board is well composed uh, relative to the business's opportunities. Secondly, um, I think being uh, as transparent as you can be with your shareholders about both the decisions you're taking from a strategy perspective and capital allocation perspective, as well of, as those that you chose not to take. So, and what I mean by that is, one of the ways activists find targets is they look at the peer companies and they say, boy, everybody went to the left and you guys went to the right. And, you know, and now the stock isn't performing so well, surely you made a horrible mistake. But you know, companies often decide to take a different path for good reason. I think the key is to make sure that to the extent you decide to go on a different path, you explain you know, ahead of time that, or, or you know, simultaneous with the decision why you're choosing to do something different than everyone else, why you think it creates value or reduces risk, and, and you know, why it's the right path for this, this company and this set of, uh, this set of shareholders. So, so being transparent about the decisions that you make I think are important. Uh, having a, you know, a board that's, uh, that's sort of being continuously refreshed is important. Third, I think to the extent you can, uh, think you know, objectively about the business in a way that an activist would. So, so come to it with the idea that, well, everything surely isn't perfect. You know, where could I find you know, something to change? Look at all of the things an activist looks at. So capital structure, capital allocation, operating you know, strategy, which means margins and pricing and cost structure. Think about the personnel you have in the management team. Think about the piece parts of the businesses that you have. Do they really make sense under one roof? Are they big enough to support uh, you know, a, a public company as a standalone entity? Or are there too many diverse businesses going in different directions under one roof? Uh, the executive compensation alignment, you know, all, all of the topics that an activist sort of looks at and try to think about them freshly and, 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 and don't just stay in sort of the pattern of continuing uh, the status quo forever. One of the things I like to tell, tell, tell directors is make sure you know what an activist knows. And what an activist knows is what is the buy side analysts and investors really thinking about the company and the management team? What do competitors say? about your strengths and weaknesses when they talk to investors and to other people, you know, suppliers and, 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 and customers. Um, you know, what, what do former executives who've left the business say about the culture and the management team? 
what, what, what do they say in the, those exit interviews that you might learn from and might make a difference in the way you're operating the businesses or the, or the business? What do your suppliers and customers really think of the business and how it compares to the peers uh, and, and, and your competitors? And you know, the whole long list of, 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 of work and things that an, that an activist would go do to really assess from the outside the, the, you know, whether the business is being optimally run to create value for shareholders. And I think that's a huge challenge for boards to think like an activist, because I've always been impressed, just like you say, they'll go talk to people that left the company, they'll, they'll dig everywhere, and if somebody really wants to create a game plan for that, it's going to take some serious attention, okay, right. to do that, but that's exactly, I think, your point is that that's the kind of way that a board should be thinking like an activist. Well, you know, one of the first activist campaigns that I ran as an activist many years ago, uh, we came to the lead independent director with a bunch of data we had gathered from, in that case, the franchisees, the former executives, uh, you know, the other shareholders, you know, constituents basically of the business that we had gone out and done a lot of work on and we put it in front of them along with where the sell side analysts were, what the short interest was, returns on invested capital, the sort of standard sorts of analyses that activists do. And I'll never forget the lead director said to me, I, I didn't know any of this. I, I don't have access to this sort of information. I don't have a Bloomberg you know, on my desk. It's not easy for me to figure out what the short interest is and whether it's growing or where the analyst recommendations are or price targets and how they change. I don't talk to the franchisees. I didn't do the exit interviews with the executives. I didn't know any of this information. And, and, and to his credit, in that case, they took action you know, on that information. Right. But sure would have been easier if, uh, I, I think he would tell you, you know, if, if he had had that information as part of his you know, regular analysis of the business and, and as a fiduciary of the company. Well, Greg, um, you always offer tremendous advice, um, <laughs> and, and that's why I like to have you back, and I, I appreciate that. Um, there's a lot of topics that we could tackle from the activist perspective, so we'll have to have you back again sometime if that's all right, if you'll join my, us again. My great but, pleasure. So thanks for the time, and that will conclude this edition of Inside America's Boardrooms. We hope you enjoyed the show. We'll be back again next week when we take a look at another critical topic that'll help you be a better board member or committee member. So we'll see you then. Join us again next week for Inside America's Boardrooms. Brought to you with knowledge partners, NASDAQ, the Center for Audit Quality, and PwC. Along with content contributors, Equilar, Meridian Compensation Partners, Wilson Sonsini Goodridge and Rosati, Donnelly Financial Solutions, and the Society for Corporate Governance.